So welcome back from lunch, everyone. Uh, before we start, I just need to warn you that the budgets in healthcare are a little bit smaller than what Netflix has, so our special effects might not be quite as immersive. <laughs> I'm going to be talking today about healthcare. So a quick show of hands. Who of you has ever been to the doctor? All right, all right. I'm seeing a lot of people have used our product then. Uh, <laughs> this is good. So today I'm going to be talking to you about why robots haven't replaced humans in healthcare. First, I want to talk a little bit about this. So what is this? It's a hospital bill from about 80 years ago. You can see a few different line items. It's for a mother. She gave birth to twin boys and paid $50 for 10 days in the hospital, so $5 a day. She paid $9.50 uh, for use of the delivery room. And for the two babies, it cost $20 for a 10-day stay. So what's remarkable about this? Well, the first thing, at least if you're used to the American healthcare system, is how cheap this was. So it was $79.50. And for the skeptics out there who are saying, I know, Martini, but $79.50, that would be way more expensive today. Yes, but not that much more expensive. It's about $1,300 in today's numbers. So just for context, my uh, grandmother, so this is actually my grandmother's bill, paid less to give birth to twin boys per night than I do staying down the street at a hotel. But I think what's more interesting is that this bill doesn't just include the hospital stay. It actually includes the doctor's wife coming over to my grandmother's house after and helping my grandmother learn how to care for these baby boys and helping her learn how to diaper them and put them to sleep. And that's all included in this one cost. Now, this is another bill. It was going around the internet a couple of months ago. And you may have seen it. And what was remarkable about this bill and what the parents, the new parents were laughing about is this line item for skin-to-skin -skin contact, $39.35. So what this means is the mother and father paid almost $40 just to hold their baby after birth. And I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, that's crazy, that's terrible, why would they ever get charged for that? And that's actually not the point I want to make. Uh, if you dig in a little bit more, it turns out that it costs the hospital money after a C-section to pay a nurse to help supervise this. And you'll also see some other line items for other people who helped out, so people like lactation consultants. And what's interesting about this is that by starting to break down exactly what happens in healthcare through costs like this, you can start to give better care at an aggregate level across an entire population of people. But what's hard is that as, as people entering the healthcare system, this kind of line items and codes and, and everything like that makes it really hard to navigate so let's look at these two bills side by side, separated by about 80 years. I want you to think about how do we preserve the humanity and the approachability of the old ways while we also take advantage of everything that the new technologies have to offer because there are good things that we can take from both sides. So first, before we talk about healthcare, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, my story. So I grew up with a sister who had special needs. She had a genetic disorder. And growing up with her, I would noticed how badly the world was designed for people like her who couldn't walk very well. And I originally thought that I wanted to go design medical devices or assistive devices for people like her. So I went and I studied mechanical engineering. And I worked at Apple and IDEO, and I made things. And I worked on the consumer side, which I really enjoyed. But I always felt like I wanted to be a little closer to the problems that I was solving. We've heard a lot about that today. How do you find problems that are really meaningful and important, not just to the world, but also to you? And for me, it's been healthcare. So after Apple and IDEO, I've joined two different healthcare startups. I really like startups because they're a place where you can both be a part of growing a culture, so you don't have to go in and change it and teach people how to use design. You can just start it from the beginning. And then also, you're part of something, you're, you're a big part of something versus a small part of a big operation. So for me, I've really enjoyed working at healthcare startups. This, the first one I joined actually was Council over on the right. It does DNA testing for times in life where you're trying to make a clinical decision. So 
if you're having a baby or you maybe have a family history of cancer, that's the sort of testing that we did there. The other company is Metasas, and we do software for doctors and nurses and other people in hospitals who care for patients. And I will be using case studies from these two companies to illustrate some points throughout my presentation. All right, but before we talk about healthcare, I want to talk a little bit about what really good design looks like in the consumer space, just so we have a, a shared benchmark. So this is, uh, it's called uh, constant contact, but it doesn't really matter what the company is. The point is that it's a very standard way to do email campaign management. So if you have a lot of people that you want to email, this is an interface for doing that. It's fine, it's basic, it gets the job done. There's another company that does an email campaign manager that you may be familiar with, MailChimp. I love MailChimp, right? They've taken what's a fairly basic, kind of boring product and made it come to life through the use of this guy, Freddie. You may be familiar with him. He's, I assume, a chimp because of the name MailChimp. Uh, and he makes a kind of basic product come to life through emotions and playful fun. And to me, that's the best, some of the best work that designers are doing in the consumer space. But while I love this kind of playfulness and emotion in the consumer side, it, it doesn't quite work in healthcare. And let me tell you why. So in healthcare, people, as you probably have experienced, they come into it with a very heightened state of emotion already. They're scared, they're, they're worried, they're anxious. And so what you need to do as a designer is you don't want to surprise and delight them like you would on the consumer side. You want to calm and support them to help them get through this very complicated situation and make the right decisions from a lot of data. So today I'm going to talk you through some of those emotions. Let's think through what does that really mean. So here's the first example. Imagine, imagine that you're a parent who's pregnant, so probably a mother, and you've had a blood test and this test can tell you two things. It will first tell you if your baby is at risk for a few different diseases, so that's the first section up there. And you've looked at it and you see that the results are negative for that, so you're probably feeling relieved, good. This is you know, off to a good start. But there's a second thing that this test can tell you. It can tell you the predicted sex of your baby. So how are you feeling about that? Anxious, worried, excited? So if you click that button, you will find out if you're having a boy or a girl. Now imagine that you're not just an expectant parent, but you're a parent who has a disease that runs in your family that only affects boy children. And if your baby is a boy, that means that they might be at risk of dying from this disease. Now how do you feel? Probably scared and frightened. And how you will react to that information is very different from just the general population. And we as designers need to think not just about the people who will be happy using our product, but also the people who will be sad. So when people click on that button, uh, they'll see it just says very plainly, we predict you're having a boy or we predict you're having a girl. And when I was a designer at Council, we'd sometimes get feedback from people who would say, you know, you just didn't seem happy enough for me. I, can't you just make it more fun? And as a designer, oh, I wanted to make that a really great experience, right? That's the sort of thing that we want to do, is we want to create these moments of delight for people. But it's not about just creating moments of delight for people who are happy. You know, it's one thing if your email campaign is, has a monkey who's really happy and you're having a bad day. It's another thing entirely if you've just learned that your baby is at risk of something terrible and there's confetti and balloons on the screen, right? So that's just something that we designers in healthcare need to think about, is it's not about us and what we want to do, it's about our users and their emotions. All right, so another thing that's even scarier for some people than getting genetic results is the bill that comes afterwards. So for those of you who haven't gotten healthcare in the United States, you may have heard about how scary it can be when it comes time to billing. You know, it's, we pay for a lot of our health care, and it's a very complicated system involving insurance companies and patients paying for different parts of it. And while 
you know, most people are fine. There is this perception that, you know, over half of all bankruptcies are caused in some part by medical bills. So it's a very real feeling of fear when somebody gets this bail bill in the mail or in their email and they open it up. They're anxious. They want to know if their insurance will pay for it, how much will they have to pay. Um, if they're pregnant, they're probably getting lots and lots of bills and they can't remember what any of them are for. So put yourself in that state of mind. You're opening up a bill. What information do you want to see? As designers, we started off with just plain language at the top of the bill, right? So hello to the you know, patient's name, Jane. Thank you for taking the test, right? This is a conversation. I think a lot of medical products, it's very robotic and it, that you've lost a lot of the human aspect. So we tried to be really friendly. We tried to clearly explain what this bill was for. We tried to explain you know, who their doctor was, give them some context. And once we've gotten through the initial conversation, you know, you give them information on exactly what their responsibility is and what their insurance will pay for. And as designers, we know that no matter how good we make the layout of this information, there's only so much we can do to answer everyone's questions. And so it's our job to also give people a link to real humans that they can talk to. So in the case of billing, it's just too complicated for us to address every situation. And we made it a point on the bill in multiple places to not only give them a phone number, but also to give them a lot of different codes and numbers that we were pretty sure they would need to have when they called this phone number. Because in the healthcare system, you can often make one phone call and they say, I can't give you that answer until you give me these two other codes. And so a lot of time patients go in circles between lots of people to get all the information they needed. And what we did as designers was surface this information to make it easy for them. All right, so we've talked about patient and patient emotions. But how about doctors? They have emotions too. So imagine that you're a doctor and you're working to save a baby's life. What information do you need? You need information about what's wrong with this child. You need information about what allergies they have, what medications they're taking, and even about what type of care their parents might want for them. And in a lot of hospitals, that information right now is either hidden in very complicated computer systems or it's on pen and paper, and those pieces of paper get lost or they don't get updated. And that's just the state of healthcare, I think, around the world right now. Also, this picture is of my sister. You know, to me, this, this issue hits really close to home, and that's why I find it really important to work on. So where do we look for inspiration as we're designing for doctors? One place is to the aviation industry. So it turns out that when you have, you know, 100 or 200 people in a plane and their lives on the line, that gives you some pretty good incentives to make a system really well designed. And so we in the healthcare industry look at the aviation industry to figure out, you know, what can we do? Except instead of having an entire cockpit, sometimes we're only working with a phone. And yet we have to give the same types of information, the same data, on a small device. So before we dive into what that looks like, let's talk about what we can learn from aviation. There's a few things. One thing that I really like is how high contrast all of these displays are. I think on the internet right now and a lot of modern design, there's a lot of grays and pastels and really beautiful colors that are actually really hard to use when you're in a hurry or when you're stressed out. When you're in a cockpit, they don't have time for that. They need to be able to get the information they want in any condition, low light, stressful situations. You know, if the airplane's going down, you just want to be able to read what's on the indicators. Second, you can see that the use of color is very, very sparing. It's pretty much all black and white with a little bit of blue and a little bit of red. And when they use color, it means something. So those sorts of principles we've taken to heart as doing visual design in healthcare. A third principle that you can't see, but you would know if you use the product, is that there are not very many alerts in this cockpit. The alerts only go off if something really, really bad is about to happen. The problem is if you alert pilots on any small little thing, they're just going to start ignoring them. And if that happens, then when something really bad happens, they're just not going to pay attention. So that's a third principle that we try to use, is to avoid alert fatigue and only 
surface something is really bad and use color when it's appropriate. All right, so let's zoom in on one of these dials, an equivalent dial in the healthcare industry. Lab results. So you probably had your blood taken at some point. Chances are it came back in the paper format like this. And as a designer, I'm sure you're just squirming and looking at that and being like, oh, I could fix that. And you probably could. But there's a lot more to be fixed than just the layout. So the first generation of medical software pretty much took this layout and then put it into an electronic form. And that's really common as new technologies come out. The new versions tend to look very much like the old ones. There's some nice features. You know, they've made red color. Uh, they've colored certain numbers red, which means that they're abnormal. Um, I assume if you click in on some of these lab values, it would take you to more information, like who ordered it and when they ordered it. And that's, that's great. You know, it's some good features. But let's say you wanted to fix this and make it better. How do you do that? What, how do you make this better? It's a, kind of an unfair question to ask to you because you're not a doctor, and this is not for you. So when I had to do this design challenge, the first thing I did was talk to doctors, uh, both doctors that we have who work at Metasas as well as some who are at hospitals that we work with. And one of the interesting things that I learned about the way lab results are presented is that you have some of these numbers that you want to see every single time. And then you've got some of these numbers that you only want to see if one of the more important numbers is off, if there's something wrong. But otherwise, you don't need to see it. And so what was interesting to me as I started to question and ask more is that that's an easy thing for us to fix for designers. You know, it's easy to sort of highlight and have a progressive disclosure if you're familiar with that concept where you have certain numbers up front and then other numbers behind it. But for the users, it's a huge pain point, and we can solve that. So let me show you a little bit what I mean in terms of design and solution. So here's something that I've worked on. It's a dashboard for lab values for doctors. And you have to imagine being a doctor. These numbers are not just numbers. They're telling you a story about a patient. If you were a doctor and looked at these numbers, you, would, you wouldn't even have to think about what they meant. You would just have an intuition about whether the patient is doing OK. right? So you want to put really important things up top. So the BP stands for blood pressure. right? Is their heart still working? The T stands for temperature. Are they spiking a fever? Right? These are all things that you as a doctor are looking at. Are they breathing OK? Or do they have anything wrong with them? Once you've got that checked out, you continue down, and there's some basic blood tests that get taken very frequently when somebody's in the hospital. So those numbers go down below. And you might look at that and see a lot of gibberish, right? It's kind of a funny format. But that's not a format that I created. It's one that doctors use, right? So when they're writing down by hand all these different lab values, they have developed their own language of sorts where they just write out the format, and they know by where the number is what value it represents, which is clever, right? It saves them time from having to write down the name of every lab value. So I didn't reinvent anything here. I just used their language that I learned by talking to them. All right, so here's the blood test. And this 13, let's zoom in on that. What is that? So it's something called the white blood cell count, which is essentially a measure of whether somebody has an infection. And if this number is regular, it's normal, that's all a doctor really wants to know. But let's say that there's something off with this number, and it shows that a patient might have an infection. That 13 does not tell the doctor all the information they want to know. For that, they need to click in. They want to see two things. They want to see a graph to know the history. And they also want to see the breakdown of all of the different types of white blood cells. It turns out there's a whole lot of different types of white blood cells. There's a whole lot of different ways to count them. The important thing to remember is that we as designers shouldn't be too clever in trying to guess what will be important for doctors at any given time. It's just our job to know how to sort of filter it at the first pass and then present it to them in a way where it's easy for them to find what they want when they want it. All right, so that, you know, that was one set of solutions. Let's go back to a genetic testing question. So 
you've gotten your results, you know, you think they're fine, or may maybe there's a little something to be worried about. What happens next? You can read about it. Uh, or, for people who don't like to read, there's videos, right? So, as a designer, we got to work with some in-house medical experts. They're called genetic uh, counselors. And they helped us put together videos explaining sort of the basics of how genetics works, uh, which was helpful because not everyone comes from a science background uh, who is taking the test. It's, you know, the whole population. And so we put together these great videos. It saved our counselors a lot of time from having to explain the basics of genetic information. And you may look at that and think, well, that's wonderful. But what happens to all the genetic counselors when a video is doing their job? Well, here's the thing. So the Industrial Revolution was all about replacing humans with machines. So think about it. You probably took an airplane or drove to get here and, and booked a hotel. All of that used to be done by a travel agent, right? A person who would help you book travel. And nowadays, most of traveling is just done with the internet, with computers. And that's a situation where humans, by and large, were replaced by machines. Uh, same with the material in your clothes, right? So it used to be that clothes were all handmade. Now, I would, I would guess that most of us are wearing clothes that machines made. And that's just the story of the Industrial Revolution. But healthcare is different. Healthcare is more about augmenting humans with machines. Right, and so, you know, it's interesting. If you've ever heard of Douglas Engelbart, he invented the interactive desktop computing that we all use. That was exactly the story that he told about computers, is that they were there to augment humans and our abilities. And that's exactly what we're seeing play out in healthcare, because healthcare is just too complicated for machines to do alone. Right, so in the story of getting genetic results, these videos can tell you some basic information, but they can't tell you how to tell your family, right? Should you tell your sister or your brother or your child about these results? And if you do want to tell them, how do you tell them? Where do you start? Or let's say you came back positive for a breast cancer gene like Angelina Jolie did, and you need to decide if you want to have surgery. These are not decisions that machines can really help us with. And that's where I think the role of doctors is moving. So in the case of counsel, we actually had a button you could click on to talk to somebody either right away or to schedule an appointment and gave you a chance, once you had a, a minute to digest the information, to call somebody and talk to them. And as designers, it was interesting to try to figure out how do we give the right level of information through videos and text, and then where do we bring humans into our design? So, you know, this is an example of people calling a genetic counselor and getting those questions answered. And, you know, it's interesting. While you could probably search the internet and, and find answers to a lot of these things, there's something about speaking with a human that you just can't replace, so especially when it comes to healthcare and these sorts of emotional decisions. So our question as designers then is, where do we use machines and where do we use humans? So this machine you're seeing up here, it has eight pipettes, you know, those things where you can put a precise amount of liquid in a test tube. It has eight pipettes and it can use all of them at the same time and be more precise, more accurate, more repeatable than any human could ever be, right? So that sort of thing is perfect for machines. It does the same thing over and over and over again. But there's a lot of healthcare that is not the same thing over and over and over again. There's a lot of healthcare that's different every single time. And machines are really good at following rules, but they're not really good at situations where you need to break rules, right? So, an example, you know, another family story, my mom felt a pain in her side. And normally when you feel a pain in your side, you're concerned if it's on the right side. Well, it turns out, if you're familiar with the appendix, that organ that you don't need that only causes trouble, hers was on the wrong side. And if a machine had been in charge of diagnosing her, they probably would have said, oh, you're fine, there's nothing over there that we'd be concerned about. But fortunately, when she called up and talked to a person, they said, you know what? 
I'm concerned, come in. And that probably, you know, could have saved her life. And so as we navigate the healthcare system, there's lots and lots of examples like that where, you know, we humans and our bodies just don't follow normal rules. And you need a human to interface with other humans in order to make the system really work. So, you know, when you want something done at the same time, repeatedly, you, you know, you've got a lab result you need to check on at 3 a.m. two weeks from now, that's a great job for a machine. When you need somebody to really interpret the data and figure out if the patient has something wrong based on their lab results, that's still a job for humans. All right, so I think this question has come up with some of the previous talks, right? What does it take? What do I as a designer need to do in order to get into a field like this? Uh, this is certainly a question I hear a lot. I think a lot of designers are looking for meaningful work and there's a lot of it in healthcare. Uh, one of the perceptions is usually that you need to have a background in healthcare. You need to be very, very technical and know a lot about science. And while that could be helpful, I actually don't think it's nearly as important as some of these other traits that I'm about to go through. You know, I've built out two different design teams now, and these are the things that I look for in designers that I work with. So the first one is that you can embrace technical complexity while also understanding human emotion. And that's because the health, the healthcare system is very complicated. There's a lot of different people, a lot of different tools. And when I say technical complexity, I'm not talking about designers being able to code. What I'm talking about is designers looking at a really, really hard problem and being willing to just take a deep breath and jump in, right? You know that you don't know the answer, but you're curious and you know how to ask enough questions to figure it out. So some of the best designers I've ever worked with didn't have technical degrees. They were artists or English majors or hadn't even gone to college, but they were curious and they were not afraid of solving really complicated problems. And then of course, you need to understand that these complex systems are composed of both machines and humans. And you need to know how to very delicately have conversations with these humans. They may be doctors who are very busy and don't want to have to explain the same thing twice. Or they may be patients who are very difficult to get access to because of privacy reasons or just because they don't necessarily want to talk to you at this particular stage in their life. All right, so what's next? You believe that the invisible process behind a design is as important as beautiful visuals. So what does this mean? You know, what does the process really look like? So for my teams, we always do something called a product brief at the beginning. And it's a very simple concept, right? You open up a document or you write it down and you make sure you understand what the problem is, who has this problem, and what it will look like if this is successful, if your solution is successful. And this sounds like a really easy, simple thing to do, and, and it sort of is, but it's actually, to do it right, it takes a lot of time and a lot of talking to people and getting buy-in. I think you'd be surprised how often you can just jump into a problem and it'll be two or three steps later that you realize that you have a completely different idea of what problem you're solving than everyone else on the team. So for example, you know, earlier we saw the lab results. If you had looked at the first version where it's sort of a layout and you thought, okay, well the problem is that it's really hard to read what numbers are important. Maybe I can change the hierarchy. I can make some fonts bigger. I can change some colors. You know, that would have made it better, but it might not have really solved the underlying problem of which information needed to be surfaced and when. And you can only figure out what that problem is by doing the research and by getting out in the field and talking to people. So that's a product brief. If you aren't already doing this, I highly recommend you start it. It's so helpful just to get alignment before you touch a pixel or write a line of code. And then, Another thing that we like to do is a, do a journey map, right? So you're probably familiar with this. So you don't just think about the screen that you're designing as one screen. You think about that screen as a moment in this entire story that a person has with your product. 
So it's not just this one video of a genetic counselor, but that video is a part of everything from the paper brochure that they got all the way through the bill that they're paying. And while you may only be working on one part of it, it's really important to think about what the patient or the user is going through uh, as, during all these different touch points with your company. And finally, you rely on both numbers and intuition to make decisions. So I think numbers are interesting in that they are both really, really amazing and incredibly smart and also very, very dumb at the same time. So you can look at these numbers and you can see something interesting is going on with that blue line in you know, late September. And these numbers are really, really good at helping you come up with hypotheses and ideas. But the numbers are never going to tell you the answer or give you enough details to know what the solution is. So I think it's really, really important to pair uh, fearlessness of numbers with a fearlessness of getting out in the field and talking to people, right? So even though we work with doctors and patients who are hard to get access to, I always make it a point to go and to get on phone calls. Um, you know, there's sort of three ways that you can get intuition about people. One is you can be the person which is great but doesn't necessarily work in healthcare all the time. I, I can't go get an MD degree just because I want to learn what it's like to be a doctor. Uh, the second is that you can talk to them and observe them. And then the third that's actually quite effective is you can hire them. So both companies I've worked at have actually had a clinical team where either genetic counselors or doctors are part of the company. Uh, if that's not possible, things like advisory boards or uh, you know, groups that are tasked with connecting, you know, facilitating between your user population and your company are all really, really great ways to get feedback. All right, so we're coming to a close here. I want to just recap what we've talked about. So in healthcare, the challenges are emotional and human-centered. And as I saw by the show of hands at the beginning, there's something that everyone here has a connection with. If not you, your family. The solutions to those problems, they involve machines and humans, right? So we as designers are not developing interfaces. We're not developing websites or apps. We're developing these very complicated systems that have both human components and digital components. And the skills that we as designers need to tackle these really hard problems are a combination of technical and, and curiosity, but also really deeply human. Thank you.